So, welcome again. Um, I would have said petit boot, but it's petit boot if I'm pronounced it correctly, and uh, Sam is uh, going to talk about it, so give him a, a welcome. Thanks, thanks for that. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yes, we can talk about petit boot. Um, just a very quick who was the guy he's talking to. Um, I'm from Canberra, Australia, and I work uh, for IBM in the Auslabs group. By now, you've I'm sure you've seen plenty of us running around talking about uh, this kind of stuff. Um, my official title is an Opal software engineer, so I work on the open firmware stack, which means a different things for what I do, but one of the biggest things I do is I'm the maintainer of the, the Petibit project. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about um, what it is, why you might use it, why we've chosen to make it our main bootloader, and some of the cool things we've been doing it with it in the past, at the moment. Um, this is not the first, uh, Petibit's not brand new by any means. Uh, Git at least says 2007, um, and my colleague Jeremy Kerr gave a talk about this from 2014 at LCA Perth, about this idea of using a Linux-based bootload on your systems. Um, it's a good talk, but if you haven't seen it, I'm going to very briefly say what is a bootloader, just in case you're not, not familiar. Um, it's a very vague overview of how a computer turns on, but generally the idea is um, you crank up your first CPU, get it going, bring up all your secondary CPUs, train your memory, probe your devices, set your run runtime services, all in this kind of early firmware stage, and then jump into this intermediate stage, which is your bootloader, which is get your devices turned on, load some drivers, find anything you can boot, load that into memory, and then jump into it. Um, and this is the space where Petibit lives. It takes care of all of this. Uh, you may have heard about OpenPower in other talks, um, almost certainly. So that's a fully open source firmware stack running on our power systems. Um, it's quite different from anything that ran previously. Uh, and when IBM was putting all this together, it kind of went, okay, so for this section, we have host boot takes care of these steps, and for this bit, we have this project called Ski Boot, which does some of those steps. And then it's like, oh, well, what do we do for our bootloader? Um, we couldn't use anything from the previous uh, firmware stack, um, and we couldn't just throw anything in there because we want it to be some open source solution that's gonna work well for open power. And then over here, there's this project called Petty Boot. And so for Open Power and for me myself working for IBM, this is where Petibit comes in. Uh, it's the, the primary bootloader for Open Power machines. Uh, and in Power Machine you turn on these days, this is the first thing you see that you can interact with. Um, it's not by any means Open Power or Power specific. You can run anything else, run as a UEFI payload, that kind of thing. Uh, in fact, I think I just heard someone on ISC the other day running it on a Chromebook. Um, so it's been around for a while, but with Open Power, it's usually really exploded as the main driver there. So Petibit is an approach to an open bootloader that by now is becoming more familiar to people. This idea of firmware loading a small Linux image, um, in our case from Flash, uh, and within that, what we call Petibit, which is a set of programs and utilities to find and boot Linux images. Um, the kernel and user space and all the tools, they're just built with build root, so there's no special magic happening there, and we use the k-exec mechanism to boot into the next kernel. Uh, if you're at all familiar with how bootloaders work on other systems or other architectures, this is again another vague thing, so no one can pin in the details. But generally, have your like your early firmware stages, uh, and then open power, you let them jump into Petty Boot. On UEFI, you jump into sometimes several stages to set up set up devices, and then so you might boot into Grub, it might boot into something else to get everything going from there. Um, or you might be running Linux boot on some systems. Petty Boot lives in this area, the same kind of area, it's the same idea. Um, uh, and, and like Linux boot, it kind of replaces the whole, the whole section there. It doesn't do just part like Grub or just part of setting up the devices. You do the whole thing. I'll get into why you want to do that as I go idea a bit later. <laughs> Petibit's made up of two core components um, and some help things on the side. The PB discover process uh, is a little server process that runs in the background and does all the heavy lifting. So your device management, <coughs> finding uh, boot options, and, and booting them in one memory. Uh, mainly does this by listening to UDEV uh, hot plug events. Uh, then we have what we call Petiboot NC, which is an NCURSUS front end, which runs on every interface. So your VJ display, your server interface, IP mic console, that kind of thing. Uh, and on the side, some small helpers in, in NC or in Bash for setting up the console, setting up network, that kind of thing, little bits. And then everything else is common user space tools uh, built with Buildroot or BusyBox, that kind of thing. At its core, um, Petiboot takes every device you can find in your system, 
mounts it, and then looks in a set of common locations for uh, pre-existing bit logging configurations. Uh, and parses these and presents them to the user. Uh, just an example there. Um, it's fairly easy to add extra um, configurations instead of, we've already got grub, yaboot, syslinks, that kind of thing. You can add extras either simply just by a string parsing or something more formal like a, a bison grammar. And we also have our own simple format, but the idea really is to use what already works. You can take Pettiboot, put it on a system, and the distro doesn't need to know that we're, we're running Pettiboot, and Pettiboot doesn't know, need, need to know what you're running. Everything should just work. Netbooting is pretty straightforward as well. By default, Pettiboot will DHCP on every interface, uh, request Pixel Linux options. Uh, there's a little bit of iPixel support, but that's still in development, um, and then go from there. One of the really good things about having a Linux-based ability here is that you don't need a second stage, like is quite common on some Netboot implementations. You can directly query what the options are, download them, and boot them. Pettiboot does the parsing of the information and the booting, and everything else, again, is just busybox utilities. You can also, of course, set up your network statically. Um, and in this case, we have this option to specify either a particular file or a prefix. And Pettiboot will discover at that location for Pixel Linux files uh, in exactly the same way as DCP would, which sounds a bit strange, but a lot of, we had a fair amount of users who were like, I don't have a DCP server, but I do want to netboot. And this kind of gets them the flexibility to do that with the same methods. So, with all these different ways of uh, sources to boot from, we also have fairly flexible ways of ordering what to boot in certain situations. Um, this can be via general things like device type, so network or USB. It can be by more specific like partitions, so SDA2 or whatever. Even by, in this case, you can see LVM volumes. If Pettibit can detect them, it can say only boot from a certain volume. Then we have features that are more uh, data center oriented, and that, if, that can, if that makes sense. So IPMI overrides, as you can see here, there's a temporary override to say only boot from the network, or you can be only boot from the disk. And then just recently, we've added support for something called uh, the boot initiator mailbox, which is an optional IPMI feature where you can specify in a buffer on your BMC uh, a parameter, pay will read that, and you can rep completely replace the boot order. And you can, so remotely, you can say boot from this LVM volume or boot from this disk. So you kind of see there that given that you have your configuration screen, you have your remote options, Pettiboot, the kind of idea is, say, Pettiboot should work for a single user in front of a computer just as well as it works for 100 computers in a data center. And in that vein, so where is Pettiboot running today? Where can you find it? Starting on the smaller end, we have the Talus 2 from Raptor Engineering. This is a desktop-ish sized machine running Power9, which means it runs the Opal stack, which means its bootloader is Pettiboot. Um, this includes the Blackbird variant. If you're at the Open Power buff, if you've, or if you've seen Hue running around, you could have seen that. It all runs the same thing there. Getting slightly bigger, um, since 2014, with all the Open Power machines or IBM machines running Opal, they run Pettiboot as their main bootloader. And that goes into what originally happened in 2014 in the S822LC, I think it was called, your Minsky's Firestones, if you're familiar with those. This includes partner machines like Rackspace's Open Compute Server, the Barrel Line, and its variants since then, or other partners such as Supermicros, Briggs, and Stratton. Uh, last year ish, depending on which, which customer you were, Pebby released the Power 9 chips, uh, in particular what are codenamed as the Witherspoon and Boston, Boston systems. These are all fully open power systems, so they run Pebby Boot. Um, if you're in Mikey's talk just before this, you'll know that they were the compute and storage nodes for the Summit and Sierra supercomputers in the US, which are number one and two on the top 500. Every single one of those nodes in that machine runs Pebby Boot. I also hear some other cool places it's running. Uh, there's a particular instance, there's a company called OpenGear. They do a lot of networking infrastructure and tools in that kind of area. And for some of their devices, they've been running Pettiboot as a bootloader for that. Uh, I think it's an x86-based device. Um, and they want an open source solution, and Pettiboot's what they've been using. They've actually been really strong contributors to the project. Um, whether they had feature requests or issues with x86, running it on x86, they were right there to um, c contribute back and make it work, so they've been great to work with. Um, other people have been extending ARM64 support or doing EFI variable FS support, that kind of thing. 
We also, in IBM itself, because it's just a small Linux image with a bunch of tools in it, we tend to run this in enablement or in simulators or emulators, that kind of thing. So quite often when we're bringing up something like the new Power9, we, the first thing we run on it is Pettiboot, just because it's a small Linux image, we can run it, and if you can get through that, you're probably pretty good for the next thing. And I do still hear people running it on the PS3. I don't have one that works. It's in a box broken in the corner, but people are still running it there as far as I know. So why would you want to do this? Um, and why do we decide to double down on it? There's a few reasons. Number one is that it is just Linux underneath all of this, which means a lot of existing tools, and like I just mentioned, a lot of overlap with enablement for us in particular, especially considering device drivers. Um, aside from just core kernel support, you've also got disk drivers, network drivers, video card drivers, all these things you need to, to present anything and to find boot options. Uh, it's way better than, so using these existing drivers is way better than trying to port fourth drivers, even though we did just hire someone who knows fourth. Um, or even UEFI drivers. The same as projects like Linux Boot, we don't want to use these existing UEFI drivers because most of them are closed source, so we can't use them for an open power solution. But even if they were open source, most of them are, oh, so hypothetically, UEFI bytecode is a thing, so we could have universal drivers. In practice, by and large, these are all x86 specific, so we can't run them anyway. Pebboot's open source, which aside from being great, obviously, is really good for us as developers and for other people who want to contribute or use it on their platforms. Um, for the machines we tend to run on, we tend to have more complex requirements than just from disk A or B. So having a solid platform that you can extend upon and add features to is really important. Uh, the internal structure of Pedibu as well is defined such that it's easy to adapt to multiple platforms or platform variants. There's not a lot of stuff that ties you to any particular thing. All the core functionality is kept separate from stuff that makes it work on a P8 or a P9 or an X86 box or anything. Um, uh, as I alluded to earlier, we also don't have to modify any distro or firmware stuff to make it work. Firmware doesn't need to know we're running Pettiboot. Ubuntu doesn't know we're running Pettiboot. Everything just works automatically. Basing a bit loader on Linux has some advantages and some disadvantages, but first the good things. Again, uh, just the huge amount of existing tools infrastructure. So our device discovery is with UDEV. Uh, BusyBox is most of our tools. Um, and we inherit the file system drivers automatically from Linux. Um, we can generally trust these tools work. Uh, and that even if we do run into an issue, we're not alone with trying to fix those bugs. Um, the, uh, building this image is really a very small layer of code on top of what is just build root, um, upstream build root just some stuff to do, some flash related access, that kind of thing. And even our kernel is purely upstream. I think we carry one patch just to make USB 3 work over KXEC. Um, additionally, and as I said before, obviously it helps us a lot with enablement, but not only just core kernel work, also just making sure user space works on Power9. Um, if we can get through Pettiboot, make sure everything works in there, that's 90% of the work done for the next distro. We drop to a real shell. No limited set of commands or anything like that, so you can do any kind of debug or configuration or extra stuff you want to do just by dropping into the shell. And using all the existing stuff frees up a lot of time to do more interesting things with some of the tools we have. One example of this is device hopper snapshots. Um, Pebboot mounts everything read-only because we're just usually just reading configs and that kind of thing. But read-only isn't always read-only. For example, if your system uh, goes down with the audio file system or something, and Pedibit comes up, tries to mount that, and recovers the file system, those changes are written back to the disk, even if you do mount it read-only. Normally, this is totally fine. You want your file system to be consistent. But early on, when we're doing all this thing, we're getting a bit paranoid and saying, oh, what if we stuff something up as a file system bug, or Pedibit accidentally overwrites stuff? How can we make sure that no matter what we do in the bootloader section, we don't end up tampering or wrecking some user's data. And this is where we kind of got this idea to use the device hyper snapshot mechanism. So this is just a very general overview, but you can kind of see here we have the actual hard drive on the bottom, and then the device hyper driver makes a linear mapping of that, which is just a representation of the device, a snapshot origin device, which is backed by a RAM disk, and the snapshot device on top, which is a representation of all of that, that paper that can then go and mount. So if you make a read, read to the disk, that comes to the disk as normal. If you make a write, that stops at the snapshot device, and that stays in RAM. Unless you manually sync that back, it, is never, it never touches the disk. 
Um, so yeah, we can avoid stuff like file system corruption, that kind of thing, accidentally. Over the past few years, this has probably caught one, maybe two bugs, but it does make us sleep a little better at night. You can see here that indeed Pebu is only mounting these virtual devices. The, the disk has never actually touched. Uh, some users have found that a bit of a surprise in the past, but we are, have made a lot of improvements to make it more obvious and intuitive that this is happening and to disable it or manually sync if you do need to make changes uh, in the shell. I did say there were some disadvantages to using Linux, and we'll, we'll touch on those. So using all these existing tools from upstream in the community is great, but it also means you're now dependent on all of those tools, tools and communities with their own motivations and bugs that sometimes happen or incompatibilities, stuff like glibc changes, interacting strangely with some other translation changes, having things in the past. Uh, some of this is self-inflicted because we try to follow upstream as much as possible all the time to catch us early, especially enablement, that kind of thing. But if we had make it, made a decision to stay at one level for a while or done something more closed source, this, or you have to consider it wouldn't be a problem as such. Um, while it's kind of more popular now, a KZAC based bootloader is not the biggest use case, obviously. And in particular, the KZAC mechanism, while great, up until recently, its main use hasn't been to boot stuff as such. Its main use is probably more likely to be the KDump tool. Uh, if you saw the science talk on Tuesday in the Nakoma Miniconf, uh, you, you may know about, a bit about this. But what it, if you're not familiar, what it does is you can set it up so that if your kernel panics or runs into an issue, uh, it will quickly KZEC into this uh, crash kernel, save a dump, save for information before everything completely goes haywire. Uh, which is a great tool, but the problem is when the main use for this mechanism is to do five seconds or something before your system goes down, none of the device drivers really consider what happens after KZ because it doesn't matter as such. Um, and historically, earlier on, this meant a lot of you'd boot into Ubuntu and you happen to have some device where its driver didn't account for KZ in this way and everything just completely went to flames straight away. So we burnt a lot of time there uh, finding devices here that were handling this, helping them, helping or fixing it ourselves or helping distributors uh, fix it, getting it upstream. It's a way better now, but it did burn a lot of time there. And it can make adding arbitrary drivers a bit strange. Stuff, if some small device is not very common or something hasn't been tested yet, it's something to think about if it will actually handle KZ properly. For us, even smaller use case is a KZ based bootloader running on power. Uh, obviously, power is a great architecture, but it's not the biggest. And so upstream changes can cause issues for us. Um, or change some things. A fun bit of trivia for power is that we can actually switch the running endianness at runtime. You can go big to little endian, and usually that works. But uh, again, this wasn't something necessarily considered at the time for things like KZEC. Uh, there, one issue was, um, I think you boot, went from a little endian petty boot and booted a big endian distro. Your main CPU would be like, great, I'll switch to the other endianness and then all your secondaries forgot. And you came in mixed endianness into the distro and nothing really worked after that. Um, uh, slightly less power specific issue was uh, there was a file system, I think it was XFS top of my head, but I have to go check, where if it uh, went down with the dirty file system uh, in one endianness, say a little, and you came around back to Pettyboot in big endian and tried to replay that general cover the file system, there was a huge bug there. That didn't work at all. More generally though, um, something to consider is that we're putting an open source solution into something that's really traditionally a closed space. Um, like I said before, we run really close to upstream, which is great for development and maintenance, and making sure stuff works. Uh, but we do occasionally release firmware at stable levels. But we don't make a strong guarantee on an ABI or something in the Petibit shell, for example. We don't want people to depend on very specific versions of things they're gonna be in there, because we have a bunch of different machine variants and we're trying to make it a very uh, upstream thing. You can always iterate from GitHub, for example. Um, one e place where it's called issues was in device driver utilities. So if you have a RAID controller or you have a storage controller or something, these tend to come with a, a small program you can use to set up that, set up that device. Um, and at first this was great because, oh, I don't have to boot into my OS. OS. I don't have to half install something and set up my devices. I can just boot into Payboot, run this, install straight to it. So that was, that's a really good part. Then, but then people said, oh, why don't we just include this in Pettyboot? Why don't we just include it on the Flash or something? We can always have it there. And there's two big reasons why we didn't want to do this. 
One is they're generally closed source blobs, so we don't really want to include that in our open source bootloader. And the other is that we don't want to track dependencies for a thousand different um, device utilities and, the, and dedicate flash space to them, which is only about 16 megabytes or so, so we're really up against the limit there. So to deal with this, we have this notion of a Petaboot plugin interface. Uh, my colleague Jeremy McCurd did the original work for this to set it up. And I've been doing some work to improve the UI side of it and the background automation to make it more transparent to the users. It's not particularly a complicated concept. Basically, you take whatever this tool is, uh, and you put it in directory, you set up some basic file structure for any dependencies it needs, a little bit of metadata, and the Petaboot plugin tool will CPI all that up into an archive. Sorry. And then you can put that on the machine in Petaboot. Petaboot will unpack it, set up some symlinks, that kind of stuff, and make the tool available. And then when you go to run that, uh, that command, wherever it is, Petaboot runs it in a cheroot, so it always depends is available and everything just works. Petaboot can automatically scan the disk and the network at the same time as we're looking for boot options to find these things. And it compiles them and presents them to the user and say, just you know this tool's here, you can install it and run it if you want. Um, this has made distributing them really easy and we don't need to carry them in flash and, it's really, and made it easier for the users to use them rather than digging down the shell and trying to double get them down, that kind of thing. Uh, it's not just for setup tools or anything, you basically package anything in there, something for configuration, debug, a game if you feel like it. Um, it all basically works there. Kind of a similar problem is uh, either people within IBM or other partner vendors or uh, completely different companies working on other stuff like Open Gear saying, we want to add this feature or this configuration option, whatever it is, to Petaboot. How do we do that? Um, and that's fine. One or two of these is easy enough to add into Petaboot and separate it out. But if these features, these things are always coming all the time, um, or there's some random variant of machine, everything, we don't always want to be adding these, these very niche features to Petaboot to the main core base, um, core code base. Uh, and then you've got to worry about flash space and which version you're running, that kind of stuff. So we started to think, can we use this infrastructure, or the plugin infrastructure, to kind of solve this problem as well? Uh, and this is something in development at the moment, but this notion of having command definitions. So in the same kind of metadata, you can, it's quite a simple format, um, define some commands, arguments, how it's run, some help text and kind of stuff to, to show it to the user. Um, and Pettyboot can parse that and then just generate a UI to represent that. Um, which means we can kind of add these custom options without modification and it only it takes effect on some particular systems that need it. Not only just for general class machines, or it might also be for a specific deployment of machines at one data center. They want something specific for that, but we don't want to put it in the code base. So this kind of takes care of that. As a brief aside, we kind of use, well, I've kind of used this to do the cool thing and try out Rust, obviously. Uh, Pettyboot is one of those projects that is still almost entirely written in C with a bit of shell on the side. Um, and when adding this, it's kind of like, well, need to pass some more user-provided user text in C. That sounds a bit gross. Why don't we try and do this with something in a more safer language? So we have this kind of relatively simple Rust parser, which does the actual parsing and sets stuff up into a static structure, a small FFI layer to parse it over to the existing pbdiscover server. And then from then on, it's only working on these static structures. You don't need to actually do any parsing of the input in the C code, uh, which is good. It's only a small proof of concept at the moment. Um, but it could be a bit interesting. One of the biggest concerns was just that, will it fit in the flash space we have? And so far, it seems to it adds less than a megabyte to what we're doing. This is all on the mailing list if you're all interested or want to kind of uh, see how I've done it. Um, I'm sure the FFI could be better, but go check it out if you're interested. So talking about parsing all this user stuff and running random utilities, it seems like a good time to talk about security. Um, back in 2014, our only concerns, we were really, does it boot anything? But these days, it's really more does it bit what I want to and is it doing crazy stuff in the background. Full secure boot and verified boot, that kind of thing, really depends on your platform and the early stages of firmware. So I won't get into that because it's platform specific. But over time, we've had people come in and say, what can we do within the bounds of Petty Boot to improve security where we can? One of the big ones there is support for signed and encrypted kernels. So it's a kernel, in ID, boot arguments, and even your device tree if your platform supports that. And especially for me as the maintainer, the best thing about this is that I didn't write any of it. This is actually all external contributions. So 
Uh, Raptor Technologies, the guys with the Talos machines, they wrote the original support for GPG ME. And then the Open Gear um, guys came along and said, oh, that's great, but we'd like to use OpenSSL. So they extended and added that support to do all that. Um, yeah, as part of that, they also included an early approach to restricting shell access. So if you don't want just anyone who can, happens to get a keyboard to be able to do everything on the machine, um, this helps to restrict that. Um, uh, so on that lockdown mode in particular, about restricting shell access, at the time I was like, that's a cool idea, but I have some reservations, mainly because everything runs as root, uh, did traditionally. Um, as it tends to do in these kind of semi-embedded small Linux distros, you don't really worry about users, that kind of stuff. But that means you kind of really want your Ancursus code written in C to be really robust. Otherwise, you just tend to drop to a shell in your root and then it's game over. And I really, I'm not a security engineer. I didn't feel like writing, uh, writing secure Ancursus code. So instead, what we've kind of done is say, well, the only thing it really needs to have root permissions is the pbdiscover call server that does all the device mounting, discovery, booting, and everything else. Everything else just needs to display Ancursus UI or do some little command parsing. That is, that can be run as a normal user. And so that's what we've done yeah, as of, I think, v1.10. Um, yes, so all the, all the UI, all the utilities, that kind of stuff runs as a completely unprivileged user, and only the call server runs with root permissions. Uh, as you can see here, you are a petty user in a petty group, um, and you can't do anything too nasty. Um, so the user needs to authenticate, if the password is configured, the user needs to authenticate to do any kind of changes, including in the shell and in the UI. Um, like I said, I'm not a security engineer, so I do not want to write my own authentication mechanism. So this is all just normal Linux users. So in the shell, you run sudo or su if you want to do anything particularly crazy. If in the UI, you can try and authenticate the pbdiscover, all it does is just compare what you've given it to the shadow file and then says, okay, you must be a real user, you do know the root password. Uh, yes, that is in v1.10, if you're interested. Uh, still things to improve, but I think it's a really good base to build on from there. What else is in the future for Pettyboot? Um, In-band firmware updates is something we've been really interested in getting going. There's a lot of work there, but um, with all the machine variants, we're trying to find a really generic solution for that or even incorporating something like the firmware update framework, I can't remember the name exactly, to do that. Uh, automatic ISO installs is something that's been on our mind for a while. Um, you can kind of already do this for some things. If you have a, you can unpack an ISO, case into the kernel and go from there. But if you need to mount the squash FS in that ISO afterwards, you're, you can't do that because it's disappeared once you case act. So there's ideas about reserving some section of memory, putting it in there, making it mountable by the distro installer after that. Heaps of work to polish stuff of like the PB plugins or the user interface, that kind of thing. Uh, and then more interesting things like keeping the core the same, but maybe doing different UI approaches for a single user versus data center stuff. Things useful there. Uh, incorporating stuff into the OP test framework, which we use in OpenPower, and so on and so forth. Disclaimer for the lawyers. Um, if you're all interested, Pettyboot is all up on GitHub and the oslabs.org is its home originally. And the main list on the oslabs.org server is where we do all the development and discussion, that kind of stuff. Uh, thank you very much, and we should have time for questions. Slightly different scope in that um, Petty Boot seems to do a lot more than Linux Boot. It's got all the UI and stuff. Um, but um, was there any overlap or anything useful you could get out of Linux Boot? Um, well, by the time Linux Boot or, or Nerf kind of made a public appearance, we were already shipping Petty Boot, so <laughs> it was a bit weird. Uh, but I had a chance to catch up with them uh, late last year. Um, I think there's definitely a chance to do some collaboration there, absolutely, with them. Especially, I think all this stuff is written in Go. Um, which is a bit better than all in C, obviously. So potentially we could do some things in the future, yeah. Is there any other question? No, then I once want to thank you again, uh, Sam, for your talk. Right. And thank you. Um, yeah.